And there might be people that are more corrupt, but eventually you have to start somewhere. But um, if we can pivot to our deputy president, David Mabuza, not a lot of people know about this character. I mean, he suddenly became the second most powerful figure in South Africa. He holds the second most powerful position, political office. Do you, can you tell us some stories and yeah, some stories about the cat, that's it's his nickname, about David Mabuza? Who is this David Mabuza? Well, he, he was, I guess, you know, he took over from uh, Matthew Spoza many years ago as Premier of Mpumalanga. Now, I often refer to Mpumalanga as the Pothole Province. And there's a reason why I call it the Pothole Province, because all the money that was supposed to be used to maintain the roads was stolen, and therefore the roads are full of potholes. Now, um, Matthew Spoza, when Matthew Spoza was the Premier of um, Bumalanga, uh, David Mabuza was the MEC for Agriculture. While he was MEC for Agriculture, he got embroiled in some uh, land, uh, shall we say, land restitution claims. Now, there's an act called the... Uh, Restitution of Land Act, or something like that. I can't remember the exact wording. Uh, and that act says that if your land was taken off you by an apartheid government, and you're a person of color, and your land was taken off you after uh, the Union of, uh, of South Africa, in other words, after South Africa became the Union of South Africa, which I think was uh, 20... Uh, sorry, 1913 or 1916, somewhere around there. So after that cutoff date, if the land was taken away from you by the government and you weren't, you know, if it was taken off you but you weren't paid for it, um, then you would have the right, in terms of the Land Restitution Act, you would have the right to claim that land back. Now, a number of individuals started claiming land back that they never had in the first place. And a lot of that happened in Pumalanga. So you had a group of people who got together. In fact, the way I saw it, <clears throat> it was driven by an Afrikaans guy who, the story I paint or the picture I paint is that he rode into town and he tied his horse up outside the saloon in Budplas. Of course, it's a, you know, a rhetorical horse and a rhetorical saloon. Mm. It, was, it was probably a Shabin. And he walked in there and he said, any of you guys want to be farmers? And, you know, on a Friday night, I suppose at 10 o'clock at night, you're going to find a lot of people in a Shabin. That if you ask them if they want to be farmers, they would probably put their hand up. So he then persuaded them all to give them him uh, copies of IDs and he, he accumulated a number of ID uh, books, uh, copies of ID books with names of individuals and their ID number and their date of birth and so on and so forth. And he put them into different categories and he assisted these people to, f to, to, to create a trust. Uh, and this trust, which he funded, then laid claim to all the land in the Bad Plus Valley, which was a significant amount of land. And um, as a result, uh, he was then going to the white farmers, the Afrikaans farmers who had this land. And he would say to them, um, and by the way, this coincided with a period in our government where they were pulling back on subsidies to farmers. So farmers in South Africa traditionally under the uh, National Party would receive um, subsidies to ensure that the food chain uh, stayed in place. So there, there wasn't as much, shall we say, free market competition as there should be. Mm. And the, a, lot of, a lot of the farmers were being subsidized so in the early part of this century, 
the ANC government started gradually removing these subsidies. And now some of these farmers became what can best be described as marginal farmers. You know, they were, if they were making money at all, um, they were lucky. And a lot of them were just making enough money to, to keep the roof over their head. And they couldn't invest in new uh, technology or new equipment. So they were ripe for what happened. And this guy would go along to these farmers and tell them, listen there, yeah, I'll buy your farm off you. And let's say hypothetically farm A was worth a million rand. He would offer them 1.5 million rand. And they knew that was half a million more than it was worth. But he would sign a contract and tell them that in the contract that they could not object to any land restitution claim on the farm. And the contract would only become complete when the land restitution claims were finalized. So when he had tied up a whole lot of farmers on deals like this, he then got this, this fake, well, it wasn't fake, it was real, but it was founded on a fake basis, this community trust of black, uh, uh, black owned uh, community trust, where these people put a fake claim together saying that they were kicked off their land uh, by white farmers uh, who took over their land. And then uh, money obviously changed hands and this claim went through the land restitution uh, process. It was advertised in the media as it's supposed to be done and gazetted. And then uh, all, these, all these farms were, were compulsorily purchased by the land uh, restitution, the local uh, regional land claims committee, uh, got money from the taxpayer and they paid for these farms. But farmer A will go back to him, who signed a contract for 1.5 million, um, he wasn't the person that received the proceeds of sale. He only got his 1.5 million. The land was actually sold for 6 million, or in some cases, 8 million. It was sold for 2,000% more in the worst possible case. It was sold for 2,000% more than it was worth. So you had this situation where all the values of the land were inflated. And the valuations were carried out by a particular valuator, and they were all of them inflated. And coincidentally, the inflated values uh, were the amounts that were paid to this middleman who'd entered into all the contracts. But the piece of the jigsaw that helped this whole thing go through was the MEC, the minister, uh, the, the member of the executive council for Pumalanga, responsible for agriculture, was signing off on documents which were fraudulent, which enabled all of these transactions to come to fruition. So um, this raised its head recently in a court case. And um, the lawyer of David Mabuza was desperate to try and suppress the evidence coming out but he couldn't, it came out. So I think uh, that's a bit of a story to tell. Then you have another interesting story to tell involving David Mabuza, and we call it, um, <laughs> it's, it's a sexy story. It's about the butler, you know? And the butler uh, created a fake story which found its way into the hands of a Matthews Porza and Matthews Porza published it because he'd fallen out with David Mabuza. And the butler then became a witness in a, in a defamation case. Um, and the butler came to see me afterwards and told me that he'd been paid bribes to by David Mabuza through his attorney uh, to give false evidence in the case. And he gave the false evidence, he received the money, but the judge was able to see through the false evidence and labeled him a liar. So, you know, that's another little story we have, which is, is very interesting. And for some reason, hasn't found itself into a criminal court yet, because if you pay a witness to, 
uh, say things in court, that's that's an offence. You know, you're defeating mm. or obstructing the ends of justice. Now, then, of course, you have the case about the robbery that took place at David Mabuza's luxury home in Pumalanga. And in the police report, he, he mentioned that uh, a large amount of cash was stolen, running into millions of rand. Now, the whole country started asking questions. Well, hang on a minute. You're a politician. What are you doing with millions of rand of cash in your house? No answer. That whole thing went quiet, you know, in the docket, the investigation for the robbery of his house. I think uh, David Mabuse is quite happy that the police were never able to locate the suspects because somebody would then say, well, where did all this money come from? So there are these questions hanging over him. Um, and I guess sooner or later, he's going to have to answer them. Hmm. And that's frightening. I mean, he's just a bullet away from becoming president. But is, it, it, aren't there also some stories about political assassinations connected with David Mabuza? Well, they are that. They are just stories, you know, they're hearsay. And, you know, I'm a factual person. I'm a forensic consultant. And I prefer to stick to stuff which I either know about and rather than propagate um, hearsay stories. But there have been without a doubt, a lot of assassinations um, in Pumalanga, and there are allegations, and that's all they are. I've never seen any evidence. There are allegations that somehow, somewhere, David Mabuza has a finger in the pie. Hmm. So it is widely known that Mabuza basically gave Ramaphosa the presidency, the presidency of the ANC. He was, his province was the deciding vote. What do you think was promised to Mabuza to, in exchange for Ramaphosa's pres presidency? Well, I think deputy president, that's what it came to. You know, um, people refer to him as the kingmaker. He was referring to himself as the kingmaker. And what he did was he took which is patently a corrupt system anyway, which is the ANC internal elections. Um, and they are patently corrupt, you know, money changes hands and people vote. Now that's corrupt. And I think on, on this occasion, um, he was able to swing the vote towards Ramaphosa. And in return, he became deputy president. Now, if he doesn't become the next president, he will have broken the cycle because up until now, the deputy president always becomes the president. Mm. On the other side of the coin, if he does become the president, a lot of people in South Africa have got to be very, very worried because however bad we think Jacob Zuma was, um, David Mabuza um, will be far, far worse. Oh, why do you say that? Because... They don't call him the cat for nothing, you know. Uh, he's very wily, he's very slippery, and, um, you know, you just got to look at the messages he's been putting out. He's trying to give the impression that he's a good guy. Um, what's he been doing trotting up to Russia for treatment on alleged food poisoning or something like that, you know? There, there are a lot of unanswered questions about this guy. Um, and his association with certain people. And some of those people are very sleazy people indeed. Now, when you lie down with dogs, you get fleas. And one has to wonder why our deputy president is lying down with some of the people he's lying down with. Mm. So you, you can basically refer to him as a smarter version of Zuma, which would be a disaster to South Africa. Um, but a lot of people, our viewers, would be very interested to hear about the underworld, these, these figures that commit these murders, these political assassinations. Do you know how this underworld operates? How does a person like Mabuza or Ace Mahashule, if they want to murder someone, how do they carry that out? What is the process involved? Well, it's very simple. They hire, they hire hitmen to go and kill people. I mean, um, you know, we have a very high level of unemployment in this country. Uh, guns, 
are readily available on the black market. So unfortunately, well, fortunately, most of these so-called um, guns for hire, they are, for the most part, they're quite incompetent. Um, I mean, there have been several attempts on my life and, you know, they haven't even come close. Uh, so unfortunately, um, there are a number of people around who don't have any money and they're prepared to kill for money. So they, you, you can hire people to kill. And that's what's been going on. And these would be former police officers? Uh, not always. Some of them may be. Others might be ex-army. You know, what you have to remember during the apartheid days, um, the National uh, Party government were very good at training black people to be traitors and to and kill each other, you know. Um, so the skills were put there by the apartheid government, and those skills are still around. Now, um, if a person's got no money and somebody offers him a bag full of money to go and kill somebody and then tells him he'll get another bag when the job is done, um, there you go. It's quite a straightforward process. Yeah. And, the pro and, and the problem is the, the people who are out there involved in hanky-panky, they know this. So you and me and all the other taxpayers, we're paying for their bodyguards because they, they're afraid to go around without bodyguards. So um, the, the people involved in the most hanky-panky have the most bodyguards.